Our 2023 Blackham lecturer here with me tonight is Professor Roy Cohen Kadosh, uh, a neuropsychologist uh, by training. Roy is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience and Head of School of Psychology at the University of Surrey. His research focuses on the psychological and biological factors that shape learning and thinking, with a special focus on maths and sustained attention. He is a pioneer in using painless and safe brain stimulation techniques to manipulate neuronal activity and to change how the brain works with short or long-term effects to improve learning and thinking processes. We're delighted to have him here tonight for his Blackham Lecture, Pay Attention, Neuroscience, Ethics and ADHD. I'll hand over, him to now, uh, hand over to him now. Welcome, Roy. It's um, a pleasure and a delight to be here and thank you everyone for uh, joining where, wherever you are. Okay, so um, the title of the talk is Pay Attention, Neuroscience, Ethics, and ADHD. And I would like to start with the question um, of why do we really need to pay attention? Okay. What, why attention is really important? And there are many answers for that. I would like to give you a few examples how attention are, well, um, how attention is really important in our everyday life. So, for example, um, when we're thinking about education and learning, uh, something that I'm fascinated about, you could see in these examples uh, how sometimes people can be really focused and attentive. And it has been shown that when you have, if you have better attention, you're going also to have most likely um, better performance, better educational attainment. A lot of time people are not able to focus. Um, hopefully it's not, uh, you were not one of those in the upper left uh, corner, um, which of course it's uh, an, extreme, uh, an extreme example. Hopefully it's not going to happen tonight. Uh, you, if you're not attentive, you can actually uh, miss some information you're not going to learn the best way. And of course, there are some, well, already in the title, some, um, some cases that attention uh, is not at the optimal level and could be, for example, in some cases, in clinical cases, being characterized like uh, attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. So this is when we're thinking about education and learning. Um, but also, Attention can be very important um, when we're thinking about um, traffic, right? If it is uh, with drivers that a lot of time have, uh, especially nowadays, have a lot of distractors around them. If it is by the phone or um, other passengers, for example, that can be next to them, working long hours that can affect how attentive we are on road and can lead, unfortunately, to uh, some fatal um, accidents, or that we have a very monotonous environment that could be very boring and our attention is going to drift away into other places instead of us being focused on what we need to do. And beyond, the, beyond that, in our workplace or leisure, if you, for example, um, if you like to cook, you need to pay attention to the ingredients that you put, the exact orders of what you need to do. You should not skip by mistake, um, and it happened to me in the past, uh, you know, a certain stage in the cooking because it's not going to be as successful. Um, if you pass the roads or important for others people's safety, if you read documents, uh, whether you are a um, solicitor, scientist, or any other works that uh, requires you to pay attention to the details, to the small details, that sometimes if you don't do, can lead to, um, to um, unfortunate consequences. And talking about unfortunate consequences, uh, air traffic controllers is a very uh, demanding in terms of attention. You need to pay attention to a lot of information that's coming in real time and being able to um, really stay focused and not um, drift in terms of your attention. Now, when I mention here attention and attention and again and again, I'm, I focused here on sustained attention. And by that, I mean the ability to maintain an alert and goal-directed focus in the absence of exogenous stimulation. 
What do I mean by that? You could see on the left side, very exciting audience. They're watching, for example, probably a 3D movie. It's something that really attracts their attention. It's an exogenous stimulation. When we're talking about sustained attention, it's more the examples on the right. It's more endogenously supported attention um, without the um, exogenous or the exciting uh, stimulu that appears outside. Now, there are um, multiple uh, clinical um, cases that are associated with poor attention, with attention deficit. ADHD, it's something that I, I assume a lot of you are aware of. Um, other examples are, for example, traumatic brain injuries. So for example, when our brain um, can have a trauma, can suffer from a trauma, such as, for example, a uh, traffic accident. And when I was trained as a neuropsychologist, this, were actually, this was the unit that I was in, and you could see some of the cases there. Um, Unfortunately, uh, sustained attention is declining with age. Um, when I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about this aspect, I also want to say this is when we're talking in general. They're all the time going to be outliers, but in general, attention seems to uh, decline from around the age of uh, 40, 40 plus, and um, it means that as we're getting older, our attention is not the same as it used to be when we were younger. The other examples are schizophrenia, autism, and nowadays, unfortunately, there is a, a new kid in the block, which is long COVID. And there are some people that due to um, the pandemic, they now suffer from um, difficulties to concentrate and showing uh, poor sustained attention. Now, how do we evaluate uh, how can we quantify people sustain attention? For that, there are different cognitive tasks that allows us to um, examine how people perform when we give them these tasks. These are usually very monotonous, very boring tasks that they need to do um, in, in the lab, and we can quantify their performance. So for example, uh, on the screen, you have the continuous monitoring task. It's relatively in fast speed there, but what you need to detect is whenever there is a change in the contrast. And whenever there is a change in the contrast, you need to press a button. And what the psychologists quantify here is not only how fast you are, but uh, for example, how consistent you are in terms of your responses. If you are not focused, you will see that there is much more heterogeneous uh, response pattern. So people are not very consistent and therefore we can see when we analyze the data that the data is very variable when people are, do not have good attention in contrast to those that have very good attention and able to perform it in a, very, uh, in a more um, consistent pattern. Now, when we look on the brain, um, there are um, there, there are some uh, there are a lot of studies on sustained attention, and um, a lot of time, what um, scientists can do, they can gather all these different studies and see if there is a consistent pattern, and this is what we call meta analysis. And when we uh, do meta-analysis, this is by uh, my colleague, uh, Masoud Hussain, um, we could um, look on data coming from uh, neuroimaging, when we're using, for example, when you put people inside the magnetic bore and record their brain activation, we can um, look on studies that uh, use electrophysiology. So they record changes, very tiny changes in terms of electrical activities that occurred in the areas and we can record them on the scalp and from lesion studies. So people, for example, that have some type of damage to the brain. And these studies showing that um, our ability, so the performance when people perform sustained attention task or their ability to perform sustained attention task is based on um, both the prefrontal cortex that you could see here in the uh, right side of the uh, picture 
and the parietal cortex. And this is called the frontoparietal network. Of course, there are other brain regions that are involved uh, in sustained attention, but there is a, it's quite consistent that you find frontoparietal network to be involved when, um, when people perform sustained attention tasks. One of the fascinating things is that even when the brain is at rest, we can still record the pattern of the brain. When people do not do any sustained attention tasks, we can just record how the brain works when we are at rest, and it still can predict sustained attention performance. The other thing that it is very interesting is that the same network that predicts sustained attention performance can also uh, predict successfully the severity of ADHD. Okay, if someone has ADHD, and of course the the severity of that. This is uh, suggesting that uh, some um, clinical cases like ADHD are not all or none. It is a continuum. Okay. Um, and of course, there is a certain cutoff that's been decided that from there, someone has ADHD. Beneath that, it's a subclinical cases, but they might have a tendency uh, for uh, poor attention and showing some of the symptoms that are associated with ADHD. The um, nice thing about neuroscience or science in general is doesn't only based on understanding. Uh, neuroscience nowadays also allows us uh, to um, try to change the brain, to change how the brain works, and not only to understand how the brain works and how it's involved in different cognitive or emotional um, um, abilities, but also um, how can we actually change it in order to understand the, whether these regions are really critical for a given function and if we can actually use it in order to improve people with um, some uh, poor performance. I would like to uh, share with you a video about neurostimulation, so the ability to stimulate the brain, just for you to uh, get a bit of, uh, of, of um, a, a taste here. And uh, this is um, a brain stimulation that it is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So over here, we uh, place a magnetic uh, coil above the uh, participant, uh, above the individual um, uh, head, above the area that we want to stimulate. And it allows us to change how this area works. And I would like to show you the video. I hope you could um, hear the clicks there. I would like also to uh, thank to uh, Professor Alex Sack from uh, Maastricht who uh, shared with me this video. Okay, I hope that you could see that whenever there was uh, the click from the magnetic coil, there was a movement in the um, in the finger of the uh, individual. Uh, this is actually uh, Teresa, who's the uh, partner of uh, Alexak. And um, what what happens there is that uh, they Alex stimulated the motor cortex that uh, control the movement of the finger. And whenever he did it, he was able to, to lead to a change in the finger, um, in, in, in Teresa's finger. So this was transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'm going to uh, tell you about um, another form of brain stimulation, which is um, quite uh, novel and, and unique. And it's called transcranial random noise stimulation, or TRNS in short. In uh, TRNS, we have, um, uh, we, we sent a very low current, painless, um, and it's considered to be safe, that um, the current that is, uh, that is uh, sent there can change the uh, excitability of the areas beneath the electrodes. So we put an electrode on the scalp participants with the idea that we want to change how the brain, how the areas beneath these electrodes, how do they function? And what we know about random noise, and this is something that uh, I was really surprised to find out, is that 
random noise can enhance the detection um, of uh, a stimuli when, when they are weak. Um, so what that happens there is that the noise increase the detectability of such weak stimuli. Now, throughout this slide, I have on the uh, left bottom, uh, there is a picture there that it is actually considered to be a weak uh, stimulus. You cannot, well, probably you cannot really see or be sure what this stimulus is. And even if you could, when we add to that random noise, and this is without any brain stimulation, you're at home, I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side, but just when we apply this random noise at the perceptual level to the uh, stimulus, you could see how it improves uh, the detectability. So um, this is based on um, a phenomenon called stochastic resonance. And the idea there is that uh, when there is a small amount of noise, it could be beneficial. Okay, so you could see there, if we add a bit of noise, it's already becoming better, right? But if you put too much noise, you could see that it's again degrades the perception here. Okay, when you see the picture on the right hand side, it was it is more difficult than of course to say that this is the peak pen. Um, now um, it's it's showing that noise can um, be really beneficial, but it also can be detrimental. If the picture is also very good and you apply to that noise, it's not going to be beneficial. It can actually uh, can impair performance. So what we want to know is whether um, random noise, when we're going to apply that, so with electricity, we're going to provide a very low current uh, at different frequencies. So they are considered to be the overall um, noise or white noise, when we deliver them to the area beneath the electrodes, if it could lead to changes in the individual's performance. And what we decided to do is to uh, try to apply that uh, while people um, learn um, how to calculate. So this is a calculation training. Um, uh, Albert Snowball, the, um, the um, young gentleman on the right uh, upper corner, uh, was a student of mine when we ran this um, study. And what we did there, we had participants for five days for uh, 20 minutes every day. They received training on um, uh, some types of um, mathematical content. And they had to apply an algorithm to a set of numbers and make a calculation coming eventually with the answer. And you could see here the performance with the, uh, on the y-axis you have the uh, reaction times in milliseconds. So it's a time that it takes them to uh, give, the, to provide the right answer. And on the x-axis you could see the days, the five days. You have in red the, random noise stimulation, the transcranial random noise stimulation. And you have in blue, the sham. With sham, this is basically the placebo, okay? It's a placebo stimulation. People could not detect, and it's very important to say that they could not detect whether they're receiving the real or sham stimulation. It's uh, considered to be very painless uh, stimulation. So it's very good in this case. It's uh, decreased the chance that people detect that they receive stimulation and therefore maybe performing better because they say, okay, I'm, I'm receiving now the real treatment. So people are really at the chance level when you're asking them, do you think you receive the uh, real stimulation or placebo? And um, you could see that uh, with time, random noise stimulation led to better performance than sham. There is some fluctuation in the learning curves that you see there. This is because that we change or so how difficult the task is after each day, just to keep participants uh, more engaged. Now, this is really great findings, um, but the question, of course, is um, whether what happened after that, okay? What happened when you know, people went home, they did not receive any more stimulation. How long lasting are these effects? 
So what we did, we asked the participant, we called them after six months. Uh, Albert even did not know that this is what I'm going to ask him to do, but I asked him after six months, please call the participants to come back. Let's see how they perform now. So the participants um, came to the lab and they did again the task. They had the same problems that they saw six months before, but in addition, we also gave them new problems that they had to apply on them, the algorithm that they learned. And what we found there, which I think was quite um, quite amazing, is that the effects are long lasting. So six months after, you could see here um, in red, again, the random noise stimulation in blue, the placebo, and you could find the um, reaction times on the y-axis. You could see that those uh, who received the stimulation six months before perform better than those who received the sham stimulation. And this was for the old problems, but this was also for the new problems. Now, this was uh, very exciting and generated a huge media and, and public um, interest. It, it was the first uh, study that showed that random noise stimulation can lead to long lasting effects. And there were others who, um, again, used random noise stimulation in their studies um, in different, um, different domains. And they found again and again that random noise stimulation can lead to a similar long-term results, showing that six months on uh, some patients, for example, with visual impairment, um, to four months on, on other domains of so more um, numerical, on other more basic numerical tasks, or when people need to learn some uh, standard operating procedures in a simulated task of a factory plant, again, uh, seeing that the effect can uh, last, in this case, at least a few weeks. So it seems that random noise stimulation could lead to long-lasting effect, which is quite important. But going back to uh, sustained attention, the question, of course, uh, whether random noise stimulation can benefit us um, when we are performing sustained attention tasks. We know that it is not easy to stay focused for a long period of time, and um, Shibon Harty here, Dr. Shibon Harty, who uh, completed her postdoc with me, uh, run the sustained attention task that you could see on the screen. So very similar to the task, that, to the continuous monitoring task, this is a very similar, uh, another version of that. They had to um, look on the screen and find out when there is a change in the contrast of the stimulus on the screen. And it happens, you could see that it could um, take um, a while, it could take more than, a, sec than a, a second that it happens, but it could also happen after 10 seconds. So it's, it's something that you could not predict. And what happened there is that we again want to examine how consistent the response is. And, and as I mentioned before, we look on how variable the response is. The more variable it is, the higher it is, the higher the value is, it means that your performance was not good, that you were not focused on the task, that you showed um, weak attention or poor attention. Now, this is um, how the results look like when the participants receive sham stimulation. So this is the placebo. This is basically when you not give real stimulation. The, the stimulation here is for something like 30 seconds just to feel the same sensation uh, as in the real stimulation on the scalp. In the case of the real stimulation, it lasts 20 minutes. So it's something much more over a longer period of time to really change how the brain works. 30 seconds, we know from other studies, is not sufficient to change the performance. On the y-axis, you could see something that we call coefficient of variance. This is how variable, put it very, um, um, just quite simply, how variable your performance is. And you could see that people with weak, atten people with weak attention, of course, perform um, poorer than those with strong attention. It's also based this, this um, classification into weak and strong attention was based on a neurophysiological marker that is associated with sustained attention. 
you could see that whether their performance before, while they received the TRNS, this was a sham, so, but it's over 20 minutes period of time. And after TRNS, so this is another um, half an hour, you could see that the effect was um, quite poor in those with weak attention compared to those with strong attention. You could see those with the strong attention, there is a bit of uh, decline in their performance um, after a while, but still they perform better than those with weak attention. Now the question, what would happen when we give them um, stimulation at one milliamp? Uh, this is a, a similar dose, a similar intensity to what we use in the task that I show you with Snowball, uh, the one that we um, train people on calculation problems, and what will happen at even a higher uh, intensity. So you could see here the results from the one milliamp. I think it's, it's lovely to see that those who benefit here are especially those with the weak attention, or are only those with weak attention. You could see the performance in black before we apply the random noise stimulation, very similar to how they perform when they receive the sham on another week. But then when we give them, when we stimulate them with the random noise stimulation, you could see the uh, sharp improvement that they uh, demonstrated. And you could see that around a half an hour after um, we finish with the stimulation, the effect is still there. It's also nice to see that you bring them to at least the level, uh, if not better, than those with strong attention. So you took someone that is quite poor in terms of their um, sustained attention, and with random noise stimulation, you were able to make them um, quite good in terms of how they perform this task. You could see that the effect for those with strong attention, we did not see any effects there. It was very similar to how they perform uh, the task when they receive placebo, um, same as when they receive one milliamp uh, random noise stimulation. What happened when we give uh, two milliamp? So you remember when I showed you with the noise, if you give too much noise, it's not beneficial. It needs to be at the right level. You could see it here that um, two milliamp was not as effective as one milliamp. We need to know um, what is the um, best level of noise in order to benefit um, attention. Now, I do not know if this is something that come to your mind, but when, when we did that, of course, something that came to our mind was, could this be an alternative to drugs? Okay, we know that um, one of the areas that we try to improve sustained attention, um, not only sustained attention, there is also the hyperactivity and impulsivity in ADHD, but um, there is, of course, a lot of need for uh, alternative gym treatments uh, to drugs. Uh, we are aware of the uh, shortage uh, in terms of uh, drugs at the moment. Uh, this is um, a piece from the Sunday Times, um, a month and a half ago, nearly a month and a half ago, uh, discussing about the, the ADHD diagnosis are blooming, are booming, sorry, but drugs are running out. And uh, over there, they say that, that they hope that, well, that the supply chain problems could last until Christmas. Since then, we know, and this is something that uh, was in the Independent a couple of days ago, that uh, the shortage um, of ADHD medication um, it, it should be until uh, next spring. And uh, the shortage have seen 70% uh, of patients uh, forced to ration their supply of ADHD drugs. The um, other uh, things is that according at least to the independent, that the 62 percent reporting an increase in suicidal thoughts. So we know how important it is to provide uh, effective treatments um, in general, but in this specific case, to those who have ADHD. Now, um, when I when I saw that in the in the Sunday Times, I also went into the uh, comment section, and I would like to share with you just what uh, some uh, think about ADHD. 
So I, of course, I, um, I uh, hide their, um, their names, but you could see uh, that the P here uh, just dismissed ADHD, you know, for them, um, adult ADHD rarely exists, um, and that uh, for adults, just give them sugar pills, uh, they wouldn't know the difference. Um, AD, adult ADHD, I want to say, is not uh, rare. Um, they're um, around 3% uh, of the population, some, some might say even more, that uh, are considered to have ADHD. Um, it means, you know, with the amount of people here, we have definitely several people with uh, adult ADHD. So 3% is definitely not, not rare. And you could see also the uh, comments both by F and S uh, indicating how uh, important is uh, the treatments for those who suffer from ADHD, how really need, uh, how there is a great need in order to have uh, the medication, how it's really um, uh, improving their uh, functions on everyday life. So you could see that there is a great dependency on that. Um, I do not have ADHD, but uh, you know what I, I do have, I'm, I have problems with my vision since I was a child. I have glasses uh, with contact lenses. And for me, just like if someone will take my glasses, and I have very high number, I have um, nearly 10 and 9 in, in both eyes, minus 10, minus 9, I really, I cannot find my ways elsewhere. And I do not say it's the same, but I know I would not be able to do, uh, you know, to read, walk in the street without afraid that a car will come over me, will run over me. So I think it's really, um, you know, it's really for us to think how, how devastated it is to be in such situation. So um, the uh, impairments um, associated with ADHD um, um, across the lifespan, uh, I would like to share this with you. They include uh, different aspects. It's going from uh, things like um, education uh, in terms of academic failure, school dropouts, a relationship like divorce and separation. They have um, higher um, incidence uh, in this case. Uh, unemployment, um, more uh, likelihood for having uh, financial problems, uh, higher rate of criminality, substance use, physical disorders and alignment, and um, overall a reduced life expectancy of 13 years, uh, primarily due to accidents. Now, of course, as I said before, and I would like to stress it again, this is when I'm talking in general. It doesn't mean that if someone has ADHD, they would, you know, have these aspects. Um, but this is when we, when these are studies that, um, you know, when we took a group and, and assess that, uh, compare on those without ADHD. Now, we already discussed that the most prescribed treatment is uh, pharmacotherapy. Um, unfortunately, uh, pharmacotherapy, while being effective for many individuals, still is associated with adverse effects. And um, this leads some patients to decide that they do not want to continue to take the drugs and decide to be without the drugs because of the adverse effects. Uh, many patients take the drugs, but still continue to experience significant uh, symptoms and functional impairments in their um, daily life. Uh, and there is a lot of efforts um, in order to develop alternative treatments to drugs. I would like to um, give here two examples of uh, such treatments. Uh, one is uh, trigeminal uh, nerve stimulation. It's um, at the moment an approved treatment in the US, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's been approved by the FDA uh, to treat children with ADHD. It requires stimulation um, for eight hours per day. Uh, there, at least a clinical trial that showed efficacy stimulated for eight hours per day uh, while children are asleep. So this is when, they, when they're sleeping for four weeks. Okay. And it showed, it was really nice to see, there is a, um, a reduction in the ADHD symptoms. The problem of course, is that uh, if you stop to use that, you could see that there is a bounce back to the um, level of the ADHD symptoms uh, seen before the treatment received. 
So this is, of course, um, similar problems to the pharmacotherapy, uh, to the drugs treatment, is that there is dependency. If you are not using that, you're going to see again how um, symptoms are going to come back, how it's, there is no long-term solution in this case. The other example is, um, is um, a, a video game uh, that is uh, prescribed by um, a doctor to uh, treat kids with ADHD. There is now also a version um, that is developed uh, for adults with ADHD. And uh, this has been developed by <coughs> Achille. The uh, things here, you cannot see the small print uh, in the bottom of the screen, but uh, I put it on the, you know, I magnified it for, uh, I magnified and put it in the, in the, in the top panel that it doesn't, this type of uh, program of, or treatment is not a standalone treatment and it does not substitute uh, for ADHD medication is to be taken that together with the ADHD medication. So in this case, it's not a, it's not a replacement, unfortunately. So um, what, what happened if we're going to ask the patient also, uh, this is a survey that we run in terms of developing um, a home-based uh, treatment, a neurostimulation treatment for ADHD. So um, this is uh, Dr. Alejandro Perez, who's uh, doing his postdoc in my lab. And uh, he looked on um, nearly 600 uh, patients with ADHD uh, from the UK. And um, if you ask them if they would like to have an alternative treatment, you could see that there is a huge uh, interest in such solution. So if you just ask them if they would like to uh, join such a trial, um, around, well, 95% of those uh, patients uh, said yes, okay? Only 5% said no um, in, this, in this case. When uh, we asked them whether they would be interested in joining, uh, but they would need to stop their medication, you could see that it's reduced to 87%, but you know, still you just need to see 13% would say no to such a, an opportunity. And even if they would need to wait one month after the trial uh, to restart medication, still the majority, uh, in a huge number, would like to um, see such solution. So um, neurostimulation could be, it seems there is an appetite, there is a, a need for, uh, for the, to develop such solution. And um, I would like to share with you some work that uh, we did on that. It started with a, a book that I published at uh, 2015, which called The uh, Stimulated Brain. And um, one year later, 2016, I received uh, a call to my office. And um, a gentleman there uh, started to discuss with me uh, about uh, my work on, on brain stimulation and that uh, he and uh, his uh, family um, read the book. And um, apparently, um, he and the family is the extent family, they are his business partners. Um, they would like to know if... Um, this could be served as an alternative treatment for um, ADHD. So uh, these are the, um, well, Rami on the left side, is, this was the gentleman I was talking with, and these are uh, his uh, partners, uh, Ihab, Yusuf, uh, and, and Gabi. Um, and um, they um, followed by uh, a call um, they, they are, uh, all four of them, they are uh, um, Israeli-Palestinian. And the Israeli government back then uh, had a competition that provided the opportunity to uh, minorities uh, that are less represented in the high-tech uh, industry, uh, such as Israeli-Palestinians, uh, to establish their own startup company. So uh, this um, allowed um, us to um, um, think about such solution, they founded uh, Tech Innosphere in order to try to see if this is going to be um, a solution. So we started to work since 2016 on a potential 
solution. And, and, and I think it was, uh, it's also created a really uh, nice friendship uh, among, um, among us. So um, I started to escort them on this uh, project um, and um, we um, got the grant. We um, brought excellent people that uh, we worked uh, together uh, since. And here you have um, uh, Professor Itai Berger, who is a pediatric neurologist, and Dr. Mor Nahum, who is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, from the Hebrew University, and Ornella uh, Dakwar uh, Kawar, who um, is, uh, was a PhD at the time. So um, on the right uh, corner, uh, um, right bottom, you could see a kid doing, a uh, kid with ADHD, doing the task while being stimulated. So what we did, we coupled um, um, and we, we coupled a, a video game that they do while they receive the stimulation to the areas that we want to change how they're active, knowing from previous literature that they are involved in ADHD. So in the first experiment that we published, the first clinical trial that we published uh, two years ago, we found that random noise stimulation leads to a reduction in terms of the symptoms, um, in the children's symptoms as assessed by a parent. So there is a, the gold standard in this um, area is um, 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 a score that is, that is based on uh, ADHDRS. It's a certain uh, behavior questionnaire that assessed the uh, symptoms and their um, severity. And we found that TRNS led to a reduction compared to another uh, treatment and the effect of TRNS, and this was really important, uh, still persisted one week after. So we ran another experiment uh, that was published uh, this year, another clinical trial that was published uh, this year. And over there, we want to see what happened three months, sorry, three weeks after. So you have here the ADHDRS um, uh, score on the y-axis, lower values indicated uh, that there is a reduction in the symptom. There is, it's, a, it's a better score. Uh, you could see on the x-axis, the baseline, what happened after 10 sessions of stimulation. So this was um, over um, two weeks, so 10 sessions, and after uh, three weeks after the end of the treatment. Again, red is uh, random noise stimulation. You could see that there is a reduction in terms of the, uh, the there is an improvement in terms of the ADHD symptoms and the effect lasts at least three weeks after. Um, this was um, better, of course, compared to, to the sham, uh, to the placebo stimulation. Now, uh, we are now uh, starting a, a multi-center clinical trials in the uh, US with um, excellent uh, partners there uh, with the hope to uh, show the effect uh, there as well and gain um, an FDA approval. I would like to uh, share with you um, some aspects on the uh, future directions. One of the things is that um, we still see that not everyone showing the benefit from the treatment, not everyone uh, showing the improvement or you know that, that there, there is it is effective for them. This is not, of course, only in the case of neurostimulation, it's uh, with any other medical treatments. And the question is how can we really uh, lead to an improvement here? So uh, together with uh, Linke Van Buren, who um, I was fortunate to be her um, external PhD supervisor, um, we combined uh, neurostimulation together with artificial intelligence. And this allows us in a very elegant fashion to find the parameters that are going to be beneficial for different people based on their uh, individual characteristic, whether it's uh, their uh, cognitive functions, brain functions, severity of symptoms. And this allows us to find what parameters, what, for example, intensity or frequency that we need to stimulate going to lead to the best outcome. So we published um, 
we published already uh, some studies showing that it is possible to do that. It is very effective methods to do uh, and to personalize the treatment. And um, this also led to a, a spin-out company that uh, we established and um, called Cognite Neurotechnology. And here, this you can see on the uh, left, uh, Malin Carstens and Delia Chibotero, who are my PhD students. We uh, try to see whether, uh, if whether if at home, when we're sending the neurostimulators to people at home, they try it at home. We give them sustained attention tasks, and we develop algorithms that would allow them to perform better sustained attention um, uh, sustained attention tasks. So we try to improve their sustained attention. So here is an example of the um, of a task that we do. You have their um, airplanes that are going into the right direction. And in some cases, they suddenly don't go in the right direction. They could collide. So it's a, just a, a very similar, if you want to think, a very simplified version to um, an air traffic control task. It's not an easy task if you try to see how many times there is going to be a, a critical condition that you need to detect. It's something that the, um, that the, our uh, participants need to do for a quite long time. And we, of course, try to see if we can improve their abilities to uh, perform on this task. And while they do that, we trying eventually to build the algorithm that would allow them to perform better. Now, um, the idea is to uh, take this type of knowledge um, and, uh, and eventually translate it into the benefit of those with uh, problems in system attention. And here, just to show you that it seems to uh, work. So you have on the y-axis the improvement that we find in terms of uh, their performance on the sustained attention task, you could see that after 50 neurostimulation sessions, we were able to improve in around 25%. But with time, and this is after 200 sessions, neurostimulation sessions, we are able to improve people in 68% uh, in terms of their performance. So these are really good news. And we would, of course, um, would like to see if this could be beneficial for those with ADHD. I focus on the downside of poor attention uh, and ADHD. I would like to um, briefly balance that because it is important. Um, I, I would like to um, mention uh, mind wandering, uh, that it is um, you know when um, an individual's thoughts shift uh, away from the task um, at hand, and the, it's, it's referred as the task unrelated thoughts or daydreaming. And um, it has been shown that those with ADHD tends to have more mind wandering. Now, um, you can, uh, you, you can um, think about the negative implications of that, but there are also some positive implications of uh, mind wandering. For example, you can planning things about your life or um, perhaps also be more creative when you um, have mind wandering. Uh, there are some um, evidence for that. Um, you could see here um, a, a study um, looking on the performance of uh, sustained attention task. On the y-axis, um, lower values indicates better performance. You could see that people were on task, so they were not, they, they, they did not have mind wandering, they perform better compared when they were off task. So mind wandering led to poor system attention. However, the uh, researchers here um, also gave a, a task that assessed uh, for, um, um, for creativity, for convergent uh, creative problem uh, solution. Um, so for example, uh, they ask the participants to find the word associated with cottage, Swiss, and cake. Okay, or another question, with, um, or the word that's associated with black, bean, and break. So I do not know if you found the answer for that. The first one, uh, the answer for that is cheese. Okay, and uh, for the other one, the other the the solution for that is coffee. 
And what they found is that the more people were off task, so the more they had um, mind wandering and therefore perform worse on the sustained attention task, the better they perform on this task that assess for a convergent uh, creative problem solving. So um, this is one evidence. There are some questions whether this is really the case, uh, that this is something that we can find uh, in a very consistent manner or not. Uh, in a recent meta-analysis, um, the uh, scientists did not find evidence that those with ADHD have um, more divergent or convergent creativity. These are different types of creativity, but they suggested that the rates of creative abilities or achievement is high among um, those with ADHD or with those who have a poor attention. I would like uh, to um, briefly end, this is my um, last um, slide uh, on, the, on, on, on these matters, on the ethics. So I, was, I really was fortunate to uh, work with um, uh, two colleagues, um, Julian Savolesco, Professor Julian Savolesco on the left, and Dr. Hannah Massman on the right. Um, it is important to consider the ethical implications of what we do. Um, it was um, really uh, great to work with them. They are, both of them are neuroethicists, and it allows us to publish several papers and a policy paper about uh, the aspects of neurostimulation and, and ethics. Uh, and it leads to different questions, just to, you know, I will not cover all of them, but uh, things were there, um, using neurostimulation uh, to improve our attention, our abilities or attention in this case, could lead to the value of uh, human abilities. Whether um, it's considered to be cheating if people are going to use that um, in the future to improve their performance. Um, things about accessibility, if this is going to be accessible to many people or to only few, maybe because due to price issue, it's not an expensive technology, but still things for us to consider. Um, if it's going to increase inequality or reduce inequality, um, if it's increasing inequality, it's I think much more problematic, but it seems at the moment that if any, it's going to reduce inequality, which I think it's, uh, at least from my, my perspective, it's a good thing. Also the, um, belief that we need to fix any neurodivergence, um, I think it's also something that we should be aware of uh, when it comes with such development of a treatment. The other thing is the um, free choice, um, free choice uh, that we have or an issue of coercion. Um, so um, do we have the freedom to use, so if you want, we can use it. Or is there a coercion to use? So for example, if you're a student and you know that other students are using that um, and they're going to perform better than you in the exams, it might lead for you to, you know, more likely to use it, even if you do not really feel that you want to use it or even an obligation to, to use it. Let's say that sustained attention can improve your driving. So, you know, if you have a company and you have a driver, would you, you know, you can start to oblige people to use that, um, otherwise they will not work. Just these are all hypothetical issues that are raised by um, neuroethicists, and we need, of course, to consider them uh, because before it's going to be um, too late. There are other things like generational concerns. Um, elderly, for example, um, might be less likely to be early adopters compared to younger generation. Um, and it might lead that some might uh, left uh, behind um, or increase our vulnerability or dependency. It is in the case, for example, of drugs, if they are not um, no longer available, um, but also in terms of other methods to improve our abilities. And the last point is about authenticity. And I think it's really important. Is it me or is it a drug or technology that I'm using? Am I the same person after using it um, or not? And this is something very interesting. That, interestingly that I heard from uh, patients with ADHD. Some of them decided they're not taking the drugs because when they took the drug, 
they felt that they're no longer the same person. And I think it's something very important for us to um, remember. I would like to uh, thank um, current and previous lab members um, that uh, I could have not done the work uh, without them and also been inspired by questions that they had and uh, insights. And I'm very lucky to, to have them um, with me as uh, you know, or in the past or currently. Uh, collaborators that are all the time benefiting from their um, wisdom, uh, including parents, children, and um, a bit older participants. And of course, funding bodies that without them, uh, we would not have the resources uh, to um, carry on this type of works. And thank you very much for your attention. And thank you so much to you, Roy. Um, very much appreciate you sharing your time and expertise. Um, I'm going to start off um, by going back right to the beginning of your presentation, uh, Roy, where you mentioned uh, poor attention has lots of causes, um, ADHD, uh, traumatic brain injury, um, age-related cognitive decline. Um, we've had a few comments about that, which I will build into this question, um, autism, schizophrenia, long COVID. Um, Agnes and Vera uh, asked early on if, um, uh, if, if hormonal, ch hormonal changes such, such as perimenopause or um, uh, menopausal changes um, can also be a cause. And um, there's also uh, depression, bipolar disorder um, or um, malnutrition. So that's kind of one question is whether those can also be causes. Um, and then related to that, um, uh, Linda asks if this kind of treatment has any scope to treat the list of conditions that you that you listed or the list of causes that you uh, listed at the beginning of your presentation. Um, and Bob particularly asks um, if it could be uh, helpful for helping oldies like me. And I'm sure there are plenty of oldies like you, Bob, on the call who would like to know the answer to that. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, questions. They are great questions. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. I just gave there are some examples of uh, of of some um, some cases that are associated with uh, poor attention. They are of course not an uh, exclusive uh, list. Uh, there, you know, you mentioned several there's that are associated with poor attention. Um, whether they are. Um, um, something that's going to be temporary and then um, then just, you know, going to disappear when, you know, the issue going to be solved, for, such as, for example, depression or anxiety. Um, this is something that has been shown. So once you treat that, you're going to improve uh, the poor attention or that. So this is a secondary outcome uh, or it is a primary reason. Uh, that for the poor attention for the poor attention um, whether you can improve all this um, or not um, the the answer is that we do not know with that technology if it's possible or not because we still did not get there um, I hope that we or others uh, in the world are going to uh, run proper uh, experiments, to really find out if this is possible. In theory, it should. Um, it's important to say that our brain also changed with time. Uh, there are some differences on how the brain works of the uh, children, the adolescents, young adults, and older adults. So we need, of course, to have a bit more knowledge on how exactly to do that. But in principle, there is no reason why not. So if it is work in the case of um, uh, young adults, it is likely also to be in the order, but we need for that, we, for that we need proper experiments to find out. Thank you very much for that. I've been told my microphone's been crackling, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping I fix that problem now. Um, so um, I think I will next go to uh, uh, some questions again, like you, you did touch on this earlier, but I think it might be worth um, expanding. Um, uh, so Tuf has pointed out that this will probably get covered, but asks about your thoughts on medicating children and says that uh, we are currently making this decision for our son who is 10. 
Um, and then related to this, um, let me just find Jane's question. Um, and she says, has um, uh, random noise uh, stimulation been tried on children, uh, which I, I do believe you've covered. It says, I work with um, ADH, uh, ADHD children, and it seems more and more children are being medicated at ever younger ages. Yeah, so I'm I'm aware of that, and of course there is a huge discussion. What's the reason for for that? Um, for the increase in in ADHD rate uh, at younger age, whether it is the due to the uh, technology around us uh, that maybe uh, bias us more toward exogenous um, attention uh, to get all excited by things that are outside rather than us uh, putting the efforts and able to train ourselves much better to have better system attention. Um, so for example, reading is something that, you know, it's more endogenous in terms of attention while playing video games or television, um, it's something that is more exogenous. Uh, but also other things like nutrition, for example, whether this is something that leads to the increase, um, um, the increase in terms of uh, ADHD rate or, or other factors. It's really difficult to know what's the reason for that because uh, usually for having a causal, uh, to establish causal effects, we need to have an experiment and put people in different groups and really find out what leads to that, which is of course unethical to do something like that, to find out if we can increase like that, uh, the likelihood that someone going to have ADHD or not. Um, whether children at young age should um, be under uh, the treatments of drugs or not, I think it's something that it is eventually a personal uh, decision. I know it's not an easy decision um, whether you know to put your child on drugs or not. I think it's eventually the decision is what are the other alternative, what could be the consequences of that. Um, again, I'm, I'm not in this, in this in the shoes of those who are making this decision, and I know it's a very, very difficult one to make. But the question, what would be the, the long-term consequences of that, right? If someone uh, would not be able to focus in school to get the best potential, what would be then the implications? Uh, it's not an, it's a dilemma. There is, I think it's a proper thing, a proper dilemma. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately I don't have, of course, the wise, uh, the, the wise solution here. Thank you, Roy. I'm sure your insight is still um, still appreciated. Um, I'm going to go to a question from Michelle. Um, she says, I'm 51 female. I was diagnosed with combined ADHD seven years ago. I am interested in transcranial stimulation as I as a possible treatment option in addition to my stimulant medication medication. However, um, I had tonic clonic seizure um, in my 20s. Is there a contraindication uh, with pre sorry? Is there a contra contraindication with previous epilepsy? Um, there's a high degree of comorbidity between uh, with ADHD and epilepsy. Um, it'd be a shame for a lot of us to miss out. Um, any any comments on on Michelle's question there? Yeah, Michelle, this is a great question. So. Um... In general, for experimental purposes, um, electrical stimulation is not used on those who have epilepsy. Said so in general, because it's been used in other cases to treat epilepsy. So there are several um, clinical trials now that try to use electrical stimulation in order to uh, provide as an alternative treatment for those who have epilepsy. With the random noise stimulation used for that, I'm not familiar with any studies that try that. Um, of course, I can try to check with my colleagues to have a better understanding of that. It's not something that I run, at least. Um, I agree with you. I think we need to find out what type of solution can be provided. At the moment, I think because we try to play safe and we do not want uh, by accident to cause anyone harm, instead of causing something good, we do not include people with epilepsy. I assume that with time, 
we will um, start to include those who also have epilepsy. But I think at the moment, for safety reason, we do not do that. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that answers your question, Michelle. Um, with, okay, there's, sorry, just trying to sift through all of these questions and, and pick out pick out the, uh, the common themes. Um, so Peter has said, any thoughts about hyperactivity and impulsivity, the other aspects of ADHD? Um, and I'm going to go to Louise's question, uh, which is, uh, what is the eff effect of this treatment on executive dysfunction? Um, I think those are not entirely, they're not entirely related. I'm going to stick with those two and I will come back to you with some other questions in a moment. Let's start with Peter. So um, in our studies, um, in, we found um, that the effect was not limited only to symptoms that are of the inattention type, but also uh, improve uh, hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms. So it seems to affect both of them. It was quite interesting to see that because we know that in other trials, the effects were mostly or inattention or hyperactivity impulsivity. So it's good to see that the effect was um, in both improved both uh, inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. We hope that this will also happen now in the um, uh, trials that we're going to run um, in the States. In terms of the executive function, um, so um, the answer here is unfortunately not consistent. So in one uh, clinical trial, we found improvement in terms of uh, working memory that it is part of the executive functions. Uh, so it's the ability to hold information in your head for a period of time, despite some distractors that um, could be introduced. But we were not able to replicate that in the next clinical trial. What we did is only the case with the ADHD symptoms. So whether the effect going to be found also with the executive functions or not, this is still an open question. Um, we will need to see what, what will happen in the future. Um, we were, our assumption that it would, because we try actually our, the whole theory of the stimulation is based on um, stimulating regions that are involved in the executive function. Because some of the dominant theories in ADHD um, explain that ADHD might be due to poor um, executive functions. So um, this is something that um, from a theoretical perspective, we should also find an effect on executive function. Thank you. Um, we're very swiftly running out of time. So I'm just going to power through as many of these questions as I can. Um, so Sue asks, are there any short term or long term risks to neurostimulation? And Nicole is asking, you mentioned that there are people who didn't want to take drugs anymore uh, because they felt like a different person. Uh, was this the case with anyone when they had stimulation treatment? And I think, again, they, they tie a together slightly. Yeah. So short terms and long terms. Um, we run, so in my lab, we run now um, roughly more than, you know, we had some big trials as well. We run more than 3,000 uh, people uh, with uh, random noise stimulation. We, with random noise stimulation, we did not find any short terms or long terms, well, the long terms that we also examined. Um, it doesn't mean, I want to be all the time careful, it doesn't mean that there are none, you know, to say none, I need to examine all the different things in the world and then to say, well, there are none. Uh, it's very difficult to say something like that for a scientist, but at least participants never uh, complained or report or anything that would indicate that there was an adverse um, effect. Uh, it's considered to be the safest uh, forms of neurostimulation. We run studies that uh, was more than 1,000 people showing that uh, when we look on, on random noise, versus sham, which was a bit less than 1,000 in this particular comparison, um, 
the, the effect of random noise is very similar. It's the same. It's something that you can do with analysis called in Bayesian statistics. It's the same as placebo. Uh, so in this case, it seems to be safe. We still, of course, all the time need to monitor uh, what might be any adverse effect. In the case of children with ADHD, we found that there is a change in sleep pattern. We do not know why is that sleep pattern, the way that we assess that, we could not look on the resolution of sleep stages and things like that. And whether it's actually that they are slept better, but shorter. So it's something that we, of course, need every experiment that we do to look into that. In terms of the um, other questions, um, you would need to remind me what was the question. I'm sorry, Laura. So people who were using drugs um, yes. felt like, or didn't want to use yeah. drugs because they felt like a different person. Yeah. And if yeah. there were any similar case studies with yeah. um, uh, with stimulation, that was it. So um, I think this is actually one of the advantage of uh, stimulation because what we do here, we base it on um, the, the ideas that we base it on neuroplasticity, so to change the brain, but the brain changes slower. So like you take a drug and you're changing it completely. It's a much more, I think the drug treatment is much more stronger and punchy at one time. Um, with the stimulation, the effect is accumulated. So it's after day, after day, after day, and the change to the system is much more gradual in terms of change. So it's not something, at least in the case that we are run long protocols and we didn't do it only in the case of the children. We had also some other trials on adults. We never run into someone said, I felt completely different. Um, it's not. So I think this is actually could be a, a better solution because we're going to shift how the brain works, but because the effect is mild, it's going to be gradual. It's not going to be a, a very sharp change. Thanks. Um, and we've got quite a few people asking that we've seen the evidence that, um, uh, that uh, random noise stimulation works. Um, do we know why it works? Yes, <laughs> we have some, well, of course, we continue to examine why and why, because uh, as scientists, we all the time want to know more, but we already have some uh, good evidence that uh, random noise, it's increased the excitability of the neurons that it stimulates. And therefore, if an area is less active, it can increase its activity. Uh, we have shown that in several experiments that it's increased what we call excitation inhibition. So the ratio between um, excitability in the area compared to how much it's inhibited. Um, we also uh, run, um, and we and also other people uh, run some studies that shows the involvement of uh, precursor or neurotransmitter that is called GABA, and it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And we show that stimulation is reducing um, the, um, the concentration of the precursor for GABA. And therefore, this link to what I said, it's increased the excitability. Okay, thank you. Just give me a moment. So has your research, so Keaton uh, says, has your research shown any impact on hyperfocus that some people with ADHD experience? So oh, that's the short answer. <laughs> uh, perhaps related to that. Oh, you, I'll let you carry on, but there, there was, there was, there is. It's a very good question. No, I, I, we do not have that at the moment. We didn't examine that. No problem. Um, I can't find the question right now, but someone was asking um, that um, if uh, ADHD um, can also lead to um, more uh, more creative thinking, does the stimulation treatment risk um, sort of reducing that creativity? Yeah. So um, we didn't uh, we didn't examine that. So I would not be able to say whether it, it is or it's not. Um, just, you know, speculating here, if ADHD is linked to creative thinking, if this is actually the reason behind more creative thinking, that the fact that you are um, less focused, so of course, if you're going to improve that, it might reduce the creative thinking. It might happen in other treatments as well. Because if you treat that, then what's happened? I think like anything, 
that relates to improving human performance, whether it is uh, that you are um, below the mean or above the mean, um, I think for everything, there is a cost. It might be a minor cost, it might be a big cost, but it's a personal cost. And people need to, I think it's something that relates to what we do in our everyday life. Every choice that we are doing, there is something that we're paying for that. Everything that we decide, there is something that we need to give up or do less or, and it's fine because the question is what the choice and how much it's close to our heart and important. If someone really thinks that, or if, if we will find out that, creativity is really dependent on the ADHD and someone is really important for them, they might say, look, I'm happy to consider and live with my ADHD because I benefit from the creative aspects and I want these creative aspects. It might be they will say, I'm taking the treatments, it reduced a bit my creative thinking, um, but the change that I see there is negligible compared to the benefit that I've been, that I get from the ADHD and other aspects of my life. So I would like to do that. It's a personal thing. And I think we just need to respect it. And I think it's a perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, we possibly have time for one more question. I do want to read out a couple of comments. And um, one is from Michelle, whose question you answered earlier. And she says, thank you very much and offers to volunteer for future studies, which is great. Um, and um, we've got Sally who said, just to comment, I've been working with children, young people with ADHD for many years. Um, I think it is important to note that there are many useful talking treatments, psychoeducation for young people, families, uh, challenging negative views of ADHD. Specialist parenting groups can be hugely helpful uh, working with teachers to do things differently um, to support students with ADHD, etc. And I'm going to give you one last question and two minutes to answer it before we need to start wrapping up, I think. Um, so come back to either of those comments. And uh, Amy asks, how, how do you feel in regards to the current ways doctors diagnose ADHD? Um, and do you carry out your own diagnosis prior to treatment? Um, I'm still not 100% confident in diagnosis um, and therefore unsure as to um, the impact of any treatments any treatments um yeah let's go with that yeah um uh, just if i may just want to answer to sally sally you're absolutely right in terms of the other types of treatment the more behavioral treatments cognitive uh, behavioral therapies um as the head of school of psychologists i'm aware of those and i think clinical psychologists and, and others doing great job there unfortunately when it's looked in terms of the efficacy it's, it's less effective than the other treatments. I don't say that it doesn't work for some, but in terms of the efficacy, that, that's the issue. But of course, we need also to, to acknowledge those treatments. Um, in terms of the diagnosis, I'm not diagnosing um, ADHD. Uh, it's been diagnosed that there are um, medical doctors who are diagnosing uh, for that. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm very fortunate to work with some of, of with some of them. So I mentioned uh, Itai Berger and here in the UK with uh, Raja Mukherjee, uh, Professor Raja Mukherjee. Um, in terms of how they diagnose, I have to say they are the expert. I'm not the expert in terms of the diagnosis, um, but I know that they put their heart and soul into that and really, you know, feel so uh, caring about every person, every individual they see. And I think we are really grateful that we have such special people that uh, try to do the best for um, for the people. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to everyone whose questions that we've not been able to answer today. Um, they've been really difficult to pull out because they, they've been, um, they've all been so fantastic and so insightful. Um, but I do need to move on. Um, as I said during the introduction, uh, the Blackham Lecture and Medal um, are named after Howard Blackham, the first executive director of Humanist UK and fa famed educationist. And the medal is awarded to someone who has made a significant contribution uh, in the field of education or lifelong development. And so I'd like to present um, Professor Roy cohen Kadosh with the Blackham uh, Medal for tonight uh, for his years um, of work to better understand the factors uh, that can affect learning and cognition and his efforts uh, to develop safe and sustainable methods for improving learning across diverse populations. Um, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Roy cohen Kadosh. Um, so thank you everyone 
who has joined us tonight, all 1,000 of you. Once again, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you and a huge congratulations to Professor Roy Cohen-Kadosh. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>